Thank you. So I've spent the past three years making consumer electronics devices, and one of the, the requirements that arose through that was the ability to record data out of our, out of our devices. And um, they ran the various operating systems from embedded Linux to while one loops and, um, and various uh, embedded real-time operating systems. But one thing they all had in common is they could talk USB. And um, so, oh, USB, that, that's handy. You know, we all have a device in our pockets that speaks USB as well. Um, so, so why not make it talk to it? So today, uh, I'm going to give you a brief overview, uh, a bit haphazard, but uh, we'll see how we go, on how to make an Android device talk USB in host mode to some kind of peripheral. And uh, hopefully you guys can take that information away and make Android talk to all kinds of interesting devices in the future. So we'll briefly go over Android as a tool and then USB on Android, what it provides in terms of APIs and hardware support. And then how to take some existing code that knows how to talk to a peripheral and uh, bring that into the Android land. So in this case, a bit of C code. Using the Java native interface and the native development kit that uh, the Google guys provide for Android. And then I'll go over some of the, um, the gotchas there. So the permissions model was one of the harder things to integrate uh, in the system I had. And I'll give a, a second demonstration application that, that used this similar architecture. So Android is a tool. Uh, why is it handy? They're, they're very cheap uh, and portable. So most of us already have one in their pocket. If we don't, then you know it's 300 bucks to, to go grab a, a pretty powerful computing device that has USB connectivity and network connectivity, which is handy. Uh, one of the other things was um, we were using Windows laptops to do data acquisition. Uh, we had some custom software that run on those. But these days, Windows, it's, you, know, you can't buy Windows 7. Uh, you have to buy Windows 8. And the software initially didn't work on Windows 8. And Windows 8 just brought its own hassles with it. So um, by using Android, you kind of sidestep all of those licensing issues. You know, how do we get an installation license for a version of Windows you can't buy anymore, and et cetera. And it's got a bunch of useful APIs. So, you know, an alternative to using Android might be writing your own custom embedded Linux system, but uh, that would involve going and, and doing a whole heap of heavy lifting, you know, getting a root file system up and running, getting some kind of input going, some kind of display happening, uh, and lots of other work to do. Android provides all that for you, and it gives you a nice high-level IDE, you know, usually Eclipse-based if, if that's how you roll, uh, to do your development in. So USB on Android. Uh, USB APIs appeared as of Android 4. I put an asterisk there because it was in Android 3, but no one really cared about that because it wasn't on phones. Um, so Android phones, they can speak as a device and as a peripheral. Normally, the way you use it is as a peripheral. You plug it into your PC and, and sync your music or copy your photos off or whatever. But for us, it's much more interesting to operate it in host mode. Uh, so that's where the Android device um, acts the same way as your computer. And so you can plug a, a USB key in it, a keyboard, or something more interesting, uh, like a consumer electronics device. Um, so a couple of tips that, that I um, have for you if you're going to go down this route. Um, most hardware requires a dongle, so something that forces the port on your phone into host mode. What that actually does is there's five pins in a, in a mobile USB port. Uh, the fifth one is an ID pin that says whether to be host or not. And so these little adapters generally uh, force it into host mode, so you don't have to have a, a specific device that, that knows how to talk that. You can make one yourself, like this image that I stole off the internet. Um, wouldn't recommend it, though. You, you can buy them for a couple of bucks off eBay. Uh, another useful tip is uh, using Android ADB over TCP. So the Android development environment uses this, uh, this protocol called ADB. Um, it's also the tool to talk, talk to devices. And one of the problems you have if you're trying to develop communication with a USB device is you want to have it plugged into your development PC to debug your application, but you also want to debug it talking to the USB device. So how do you solve this? Using Android over T ADB over TCP is, is the way to go there. Alternatively, um, to avoid those first two things, you could just use something like the Asus Transformer, which has a host mode USB port on the keyboard, as well as a device mode for plugging into your PC for development at the same time. So this is a demo of one of the applications I created. So in this case, it's talking live to an embedded device and streaming out some data and, and doing a plot of it. That, that helped uh, people that needed to know these things uh, know what was going inside the, the device. So the architecture of this app, um, we started off at the bottom with LibUSB. So LibUSB is kind of the de facto standard for talking to USB devices on Windows, uh, sorry, on, on Linux and OS X. And, and these days, even Windows isn't too bad as well. Uh, Android being Linux under the cover, 
your lib USB just works out of the box uh, with, with a few gotchas, as I'll cover in a minute, moment. So plop lib USB in there, comp cross compile with an NDK, and, um, and you're off and going. On top of that is uh, some C code. So like I said before, this is some existing code that knows how to talk to the device that, that you might have already written or another open source project that you've grabbed code from. You can go and grab that, plop it in, uh, and, and um, reuse all that logic without having to re-implement it in Java or, or rewrite it in C for this target. On top of that is a C wrapper. So this is a bit of code that interfaces between your, your existing code or existing application and lets it talk up through JNI to Java. JNI stands for the Java Native Interface, and that's a way of getting Java code to be able to call into C and C code to be able to call into Java. So up in the, the top half of the box there, we've got the Java code, the, the Android Java application. And so that's got a little class that knows how to talk down to the C wrapper. Uh, the, the C wrapper has to have specially constructed uh, function names so that the Java code can call down into it. And, and so it can open up the device and, and provide a callback that the C code can then call back into when it receives data and whatnot. And on top of that is the UI. So that's a, a pretty basic bit of our Android UI. Um, use the Eclipse IDE to drag and drop all your little UI elements and, and hook them up and, and off you go. So some of the gotchas in developing that, or got, not gotchas, but the steps I needed to go through, the things I needed to learn to, to get started with that. Um, so J and I, it's part of all Java implementations, so you can play around with it on your desktop, with your, your desktop Java virtual machine. Uh, and so like I said, it allows C code to call any Java code and it allows specially uh, written Java code to call into to C code as well. Uh, it's a bit hard to get started with because the documentation out there isn't all that great. Uh, the best uh, demonstration I found of how to use it was jumping on GitHub and looking for some other projects that have used it already. So this is a bit of a demo of what it looks like. So at the top there, we've got a very simple Java class. And so that's got a, a native, um, native uh, function definition there, a method definition. And so that's saying this is a bit of code that doesn't have a Java implementation, it's got a C implementation. So you can call that from any other bit of Java code and magic happens and, and the C code gets called. Down the bottom is the C implementation of that code. So you've got a bunch of um, specific um, variables you have to pass into the function. Um, some of them are magic ones, so the, the environment, Java environment, and the class uh, context information about the Java virtual machine that's running. And on the end is the, the parameter that you're passing to that method. So native development kit, that's something that Google provides as part of the Android development environment. Uh, it's a cross-compiling tool chain for Android. So you can target any of the platforms that Android supports, and MIPS, x86, and ARM. I think that's all. Uh, and uh, so it uses the make file build system. So it's, it's pretty nice to use for embedded software developer. Um, jump in there and, and um, write a, a little make file stub and it can compile your C code and compile it in such a way that it, it integrates into the Android application. So like I said before, it allows you to reuse any existing code you've got. In our case, it's a little bit of uh, protocol code, but it could be something as complex as a, a voice codec and a modem, which I'll talk about a bit later. And so, those shared libraries that you've compiled are then loaded into the Java virtual machine and, and they're accessible. Uh, so this is a little uh, picture of what that looks like. So we've got the, the shared objects that exist in your file system and then on the right there is the, uh, the Java code that loads those objects into the virtual machine. So Android permissions. This is another one of the, the gotchas that I found. Um, so on your Linux box, your laptop, when you get a new, say, a USB serial dongle or, or something like that, that um, you might have a driver in Linux, but you won't have permissions to access it. And so usually that involves jumping on the internet and finding a little stub of how to write a UDEV rule so that when you plug it in, it will set the permissions correctly. Um, Android does the same thing. It, it limits the, the device nodes uh, access to them. But the problem is there's no UDEV on Android. Uh, that's maybe not a problem, depending on perspective. Um, so instead, it has its own security model. Uh, the device can, the device node can be owned by the Android application that you're running, but you have to ask the system for permission. So that looks like the little UI there on the bottom. So you, uh, you register for an Android intent, and it 
um, provides a, a UI to the user, the user clicks yes, and OK in this case, and, and off it goes, the permissions of the file gets changed. Um, so when I was writing this application, uh, the existing code already knew how to discover and open the device, but I wanted to discover and open it in Java land so that I could get permission to access it. And I didn't quite know how to, to pass that information down into the C code so that the C code knew, this is the device that we've given you permission to access, off you go. Um, used a bit of a hack in the end. Uh, I used the Java code to get permission and Android effectively does a chmod on the file and then the C code would then rediscover the, the same device and because the permission had already been changed, it just worked. Uh, it's probably not the neatest way to do it. I, I can imagine some scenarios where something would go wrong there. Uh, but it, it worked well enough for the use case that I had. So that's the, that's the Android architecture of this application we created. Um, it was pretty simple to do uh, once you had all these little pieces together. Uh, getting the MDK up and going was a little bit of a learning experience. Cross-compiling in general is, is just always a, a fun kettle of fish to, to play with. Um, but no, it, 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 was, it was not that bad. So at the same time I was, as I was doing this to talk to this consumer electronics device, I was also working on a... Um, well, working with a friend who's been developing an open source voice codec and modem. And we wanted to do a cool demo that used Android. So last year I gave a talk at LinuxConf about how radios work. Uh, so this is a slide from my talk last year. Um, this is a radio that I built uh, myself. As, you know, I'm, I'm a beginner, so it's a little bit messy, but that's okay. It worked first go. We managed to, to receive um, voice calls over the air. So that uh, then hooked into an Android device. Uh, looked a bit like this. So you can see some similar kind of uh, uh, blocks there. In this case, I was talking to a USB sound card. Android sort of supports USB sound cards, but not really. So in this case, I was using the USB sound card more as a, a D to A and A to D, a, a data acquisition and an output device, and wrote a user space uh, implementation of the USB sound card uh, spec, just enough to be able to, to receive and send data at 48 kilohertz out to this device. And on top of that, we had the, um, the codec and the modem running. And yeah, we managed to get it decoding over the air. So that's another demo implementation. The reason I'm bringing this one up is that the source is online. So you can jump onto GitHub and, um, there it is, jump onto GitHub and have a look at that. So that's got the, uh, the JNI stuff, the make file, and how to interface it up on the Java side as well. So uh, that's about it. Thanks very much. Okay, so does anyone have any questions for Joel? Uh, sorry. Oh, yeah, Julian. Um, so there's the ADK, which is the official protocol for USB. I guess this was, you already had a device which already had their own USB protocol? Yeah, so if you're going to create a think something from scratch that was only going to talk to Android, you might use the, the Android stuff there. But if you've got an existing device and you want to talk to an arbitrary device, uh, then yeah, you know, um, this is a bit more generic. The same code runs on a Linux box as runs on the Android box, so you can test it on Linux and, and then and off go on deploy on Android and whatnot. No, with respect to the permission thing, if there's two apps that have registered an intent for the USB host and you plug it in, what is it, does, it, does it give you an option to select which app you want to use? Or? Uh, the question was, if you've got two apps that are registered for a USB device, how do you, how, uh, how do you select which one? Uh, in my case, I was, the app would request permission to access the device. Uh, you can make it so Android will automatically uh, discover a device and, and offer a list, uh, apps can register for that intent, so they'll automatically pop up when you plug the device in. But in this case, I'd start the app and click Find Device and end oh, it right. that way. Yeah. Uh, any more? Russell, do you have one? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. So it was um, the, you obviously, you've, you've written a whole bunch of code there, so it's just implement this, this, this layer. Obviously, there is also the Android you know, built-in so how much of what you've done there is could actually be, could, have it, but could, could theoretically be wrapped up as a generic interface to provide that low level? Or is it really every device is going to need, or every device that's going to need an interface is going to be completely the same uh, So the question was how much of my, my work could be reused, uh, I guess. So the, the LibUSB stuff, uh, someone else had done a little bit of work there to scrap the Android, so I'd reused his work. I guess you could use my, uh, the, the way I'd structured it as a, a template for any kind of LibUSB-based app that you want to make work on Android, but there's 
it's pretty specific to the application you're using. So, so in uh, the case of the radio, I guess I, I'd written this um, Android device class you know, bit of code. It was pretty hacky, pretty specific to the sound card I was talking to, though. Um, so maybe that could be extended and be a generic USB audio device class, you know, little layer. But yeah, not, not so much. Um, but there's something to explore, yes. Um, one thing I was going to raise, by the way, when you're talking about the JNI is that uh, writing the interface um, functions in C is an absolute pain. Uh, there's code generators you can look at for that. So, uh, I use Java CPP quite extensively, and that generates all of the, the wrapper functions that you need to talk to your pre-existing C code. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah, no, it saves, that is. You, saves you a lot of time. Thanks. I'm, I'm a complete Java and Android noob, so I kind of uh, hacked it together till it worked. I'm trying to understand the permissions thing. So basically, the, uh, the Android knows you've plugged something in, right? So, um, or the, the USB. Well, no. Linux knows you plug something in, okay, and so Linux it'll create a, a dev. Um, right. And then, how does this get through to like? So you've got code then where the, the Java is asking the person you um, approve of this device being plugged in or something. Uh, then they, uh, so so in, in my yes case, my application is saying uh, I've discovered a device I would like access to. Can I have access to it? Right. So it's it's a way of I guess making sure that random applications aren't going to start talking to a device as you plug it into your Android phone. Okay, and then Java does the chmod sort of thing, or oh, the Android operating system layer does that. Yeah, under the hood, that's what's happening. But, right. You know, to to you as a developer, um, you register for this callback for this intent, and the the system UI pops up a box saying yes, no. And the user will click yes or no, and then you'll get the response to that callback saying yes, you have permission, or no, the user denied you. And then your code needs to do the chmodding? No, that, that's already, but if the user has said yes, then at that point the device node will be accessible. So libusb will just go off and do its thing. Okay. Uh, no more questions? Well, in that case, everybody, please thank Joel for your